Hey there everyone, it's AJ back again for the Mighty Gluestick channel. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel as well as some occasional DMing tips. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week. Today, a patron request for a couple of furry friends of the forest folk, the elven dog known as the Kushi, most commonly found in light woodlands inhabited by the more reclusive and aggressive sylvan elves, along with giant elves and giant lynxes who are also a close part of their community. As I mainly focus these videos on the lore of the world of Toril, let me give you a little introduction to the elves of Faerun and how they fundamentally differ from the elves of other worlds and realms. For this, let me go straight to the early source material, the complete Book of Elves from the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd edition. Page 25 talks about the Faerun Elves specifically. The Elves of Toril do not follow the standards of most other worlds. What unites almost all the Elves of the realms is their self-bestowed title, Talquisir. This translates to the people. All non-Elves are known as Intel, uh, Intel or not the people. While these elves possess the standard elf abilities, their appearance is markedly different. These elves are of a human height, though there are the uh, there the resemblance ends. Like their more typical cousins, the elves of the realms are much more slender and delicate in appearance. Breaking down the elf nation still further, there are five separate, distinct sub-races of elves in the realms, each of which is viewed differently by the other races. The first sub-race is that of the gold elves. You'll hear me talking about them a lot when I'm talking about the ancient empire of Netheril and and the history of the, the Elven Wars along the Sword Coast. Some also call them the Sunrise Elves or High Elves, although they do not, they do not closely resemble the Standard Elves and indeed seem more like the Grey Elves. Gold Elves are generally viewed as the most civilized and at the same time the most contemptuous of, uh, of other races. They are the nobility of Elves on Toril, leading, to other elves, uh, the, leading the other Elves in the Elven way and the Elven traditions. They're the equivalent of the Sylvanesti on uh, Kryn. The second subrace is known variously as Moon, Silver or Grey Elves, although again the name is the main similarity to the uh, typical Grey Elf. They more closely resemble High Elves than Grey Elves, which is not surprising since the nomadic High Elves settled Toril in the first place. They are the most common of the Elves of this world, or at least the variety most often seen by non-Elves. Because of their higher tolerance for other races, the Moon Elves are much more likely to become adventurers than the other Elves. The Queen of Evermeet is a Moon Elf. A moon elf. The third subrace is roughly equivalent to Sylvan Elves. These are called Wild or Green or Forest Elves. They deal almost exclusively with other elves, keeping any contact with other races to a minimum. Since they try to live far from humankind, they are one of the least seen races of the elves, although they do, uh, don't have a kingdom of their own. They permeate every elven nation, basically living in their forests. The sea elves comprise the fourth race. These two are fairly uncommon, although they aren't as reclusive as wild elves. They swim in two waters, those of the Great Sea and the Sea of Fallen Stars. There's the only real difference between the, the two nations. One race breathes salt water and the other fresh, but they can survive in either type of water. Water elves make up their homes anywhere, but are the most common near the island of Evermeet. The final subrace of Toril is that of the Dark Elves. Uh, unlike their drow cousins, the Dark Elves are almost universally shunned for their evil, cruel uh, creatures living underground. These drow emerge only at night, uh, trying to avenge themselves and their oppressors and elves responsible for their underground retreat. Um, so I guess there are the Dark Elves who kind of live more, more close to the surface and do come up to the surface to raid more often than the Elves of the Deeper Underdark. And of course, elves refer to the surface elves as fairy elves, as a form of uh, insult. The elves of the realms are one of the oldest races native to that world. While humans were living in their caves, learning to hunt each other, the elves flourished. Their nations spread across Toril and they lived in harmony with the land. But as, as humans became more and more civilized and expanded their holdings, the elves had to retreat. Since the elves could not react quickly to the constant change the humans wrought, they had to devise an alternate plan. From their court in Mithranor, the elves argued the virtues of a retreat to a land beyond humans. They argued this matter for, a num for many centuries, actually, and after exhausting all evidence available, came to a consensus. During their debates, they located a land far beyond human reach called Evermeet, an island thousands of miles out in the trackless sea. It suited their purposes perfectly, 
holding a deep and glorious forest as well as many of the other features elves consider essential for a home. There was little doubt that this should be the last home of the elven nation. Only elves are welcome in Evermeet. All others, excluding drow and half-elves, are turned away. Uh, including, sorry, drow and half-elves are turned away, for the most part. Since there seems no way of magically travelling to Evermeet, Evermeet, it's only by ship that anyone can travel to there. The elven navy, the largest known, protects the sanctity of Evermeet by destroying non-elven ships that come inside Evermeet's jurisdiction. Of course, with fair warning. The navy also provides passage for elves seeking retreat, or protection for elves beset by humans. The navy seems to know when their services are needed, possibly by magical means or through divination. Although they were once the most powerful group in the realms, the elves are a group in sad decline. They retreat from the world in ever greater numbers. One day, humans will find the realms devoid of elves. The greater world will no doubt miss their presence. But in the meantime, they remain present, and there are certain pockets of wild elves all across the continent, living in their forests in harmony with the land and the creatures they share it with, one of which is a special breed of dog, ancient and quite unique. The Kushi, or elven dog, is found only in woodlands or meadows frequented by their elven companions. They branch off from the wolves much earlier than the human-bred domestic dogs, and the two species do not get along with each other. The Kushi avoid other canines. They basically look down on them, which is similar to the elves in many ways. They are big dogs, similar to very large huskies, with greenish fur patterned with patches of brown and a lustrous, lustrous and thick coat. The patterns can be quite uh, subtle, or they can be dotted like a... Uh, a uh, leopard. They are of medium size, technically, ranging between 168 to 310 pounds, or between 76 and 140 kilograms. So, pretty huge by dog standards. The St. Bernard is around 264 pounds, or 120 kilograms for a, at best for a large adult male, and the athletic prowess of the Cushy is way beyond them. In terms of sheer speed, they are a bit like the Irish Wolfhound, in that they can reach high speed in a reasonably straight line, and use a tripping shove with their large and heavy clawed front paws to knock a target prone. I've personally experienced this from a playful wolfhound, wolfhound who easily caught up with me, running as fast as I could, and with a single tap and just the right moment, I went down like a sack of potatoes, looking up from the ground at his very long muzzle and very big teeth. I'm lucky we were good friends just having fun and he was not going for my throat, as I would, it would have been over very quickly for me. So a kushi standing up on its hind, le hind legs and reaching for something with its jaws is able to stretch up to 7 feet off the ground. Kushi have a speed of 50 feet per round, even without using the dash action to double the distance covered, which means they will catch most creatures in a foot race, and they can run for miles, running down prey by tiring them out and then racing in for the kill. They have advantage on any rolls to stealth in any sort of forest or brush, with a plus 6 to stealth checks. They otherwise have the exact same stats as the dire wolf. Personality-wise, they are smarter than most dogs, though not as intelligent as a blink dog. They're regarded as a high level of animal, in animal intelligence. They're loyal and mate for life. If one of the mated pair is killed, the other tends to waste away. Cushy puppies bond strongly with their parents. Only a fool comes between an adult and its children. Normally, they are very quiet dogs that communicate using the body language of canines, some soft growls and huffs at best, but when they need to warn others of danger, they, um, they, to their pack or to their elven friends, they let out a bark that can be heard for more than a mile away. Considering how silent they are the rest of the time, if this is unexpected, it can be nerve-shattering to those who have never heard it before. The bark is loud enough to leave a ringing sound in the ears of those around them. They often live to be more than 100 years old, which is far beyond most other canines. They have a very fond place in the hearts of elves, who say that one Kushi is worth five orcs in combat. The hounds use the distraction of elven arrows to dash out of cover and bowl over enemies before attacking them on the ground, taking advantage of their prone position to rip them into, uh, into them with their powerful jaws. Their dashing attack against opponents who are themselves moving at speed away from them is so effective they count as one size category larger when they hit them. Once down, they pin their prey with a successful bite attack, also acting to restrain the target. So its speed becomes zero and it can't benefit from any bonuses to its speed. Attack rolls against the pin target have advantage and the creature's attack rolls have disadvantage. 
The creature also has disadvantage on dexterity saving throw. This makes it easy for Akushi to deliver some very serious bite wounds. Thanks to the size category boost, they can even grapple large targets bringing down elk, moose and ogres. As for the giant lynx cats that live with the elves, just use the stats for the crag cat found in Storm King's Thunder. They are large, extremely stealthy, able to avoid magical detection, resistant to spell magic in general, and are fearsome hunters able to pounce on prey and deliver lethal claw and bite attacks. Around the elves, they are not treated the same way as a human would treat a pet. It's a very important difference. The giant lynxes don't get fed by the elves, they just prefer to sleep in the safe and comfortable environs the elves provide, and in turn protect their territory and their elves who share it. It is a partnership of mutual benefit, and they do communicate with each other in a basic sort of way. The wild elves are quite patient with the big cats, considering how normally... Uh, flighty and emotional they are applying just enough insistence to get the cat to move but not so much as to provoke it to anger and the elves are very practiced at reading the mood of the big cats no matter how confident they are around them they know better than to turn their backs on them lest the cat's instincts take over and something unfortunate happen and of course giant owls exactly as listed in the monster manual they often befriend fray fey and other sylvan creatures acting as guardians of the woodland realms I think the trick to portraying the elven relationship with animal companions is to highlight that the elves don't command them. They don't feel like they control or own them. They appreciate their help and their company and keep the animals' lives safe, healthy and long without feeling the need to restrict, restrain or cage them. The animals have chosen to cohabitate with the elves and mutually benefit from it, which means when they do fight for the elves, they are doing it out of their own motivation, not because they're forced to, which in many ways makes them far more fearsome when you think about it. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.